Shalom, everyone. Thank you very much for, uh, for joining us. I hope you and the family, all of you are feeling well and coping with this very challenging and I would even say stressful, uh, stressful um, days. I'm also very happy we have the opportunity to still keep, at least via Zoom, to, to meet and connect and tell you about what we are doing here on campus. So I will divide my presentation into two parts. The first part, I will tell you a bit about some of the efforts we're currently doing on campus uh, to help the fight against the corona, a worldwide fight, and also helping the country here in, in Israel in developing uh, tests for corona. And then in the second half, I will tell a little bit more from my own expertise as a scientist, and we'll discuss uh, how we can cope uh, with these very challenging and stressful days just by learning what happening in our brain and body and how uh, understanding this process and what you can actually do in order to reduce the level of stress and anxiety. So I think many of you already know that with the new regulations, uh, we had to send many of our employees to a forced vacation. Uh, we are only working with essential people on campus, which is relatively around only 30% of our employees. And, but despite this uh, regulation, um, we are, it's amazing what our scientists and technicians and, and students and postdoc are managed to do in helping the fight against the, the corona and the coronavirus. So one, one of the main effort um, done in the last few weeks came after a request from uh, the Prime Minister Netanyahu to help the country to increase the number of lab tests, clinical lab tests for uh, Corona. And it, as all of you know, we are a research institute and we have research lab, we don't have clinical lab, we don't have a certified clinical lab. This is the reason we, in only a week, we transformed many of our labs to be a certified clinical lab in full cooperation with the Ministry of Health in Israel. And our first big center is currently within the Nancy and Steve Grant Israel National uh, Center for Personalized Medicine, the INCPM, in which we took our uh, equipment, which is a state-of-the-art equipment, which on a daily basis is used for conducting research. And we transform these uh, equipment into two main lines that can do thousands of corona tests uh, per day. We actually started uh, recently running samples and people are working 24-7 uh, to conduct research. We have more than 200 uh, volunteers, students, postdoc, technicians, scientists that volunteer to do those tests and the efforts are uh, really unbelievable. And all this is added by Professor Robert Flor, as you know, is the director of the INCPM. And, um, and we are very proud in what they managed to do and uh, the support we are getting from the Minister of Health and uh, from our own Weizmann family. So this unit is doing or using the same exact protocol, which is used uh, in most of the world and also in Israel by the Minister of Health, I mean, the protocol of how to collect the sample and how to conduct the PCR, which is relatively an exp expensive and long uh, process. At the same time, in order to try and increase the yield and, and make the test cheaper and faster, we also open another uh, lab, which is added by Professor Erani Linav and Professor Rido Amit from the Department of Immunology. And this effort in this lab is actually in, and those of you who remember the, the building in the campus, this is done in the Ullman building and the new Morris uh, Center for Cancer Research on the first, uh, first floor. And what Iran and Ido did, they aim and in less than uh, 10 days, I think, uh, maybe two weeks, they managed to develop a new technique which allow us to do test, clinical tests for coronavirus, which is quicker and cheaper, meaning it's skipping one of the stages in the regular process, which take longer, which is the purification of the RNA. And this is done in a platform of 96-well plate and not by a single tube. 
which then with uh, very sophisticated robots, we managed to move those 96 into 384 platform, which allow us to run around 20,000 samples per day, which is, of course, almost four times what is done currently all over the country. This is a research platform currently. Uh, it's not yet approved by the Minister of Health to run samples. However, we did, we do have a, co a collaboration, cooperation with the Israeli army and we already ran soldiers last week. And next week we're gonna start running other samples coming from the hospital. And we really hope this will be adopted by the Ministry of, of Health and we're gonna still we're gonna start running clinical samples coming from the hospital but also the general uh, of course public as soon as uh, it will be it will be um, approved. There's also a lot of interest uh, worldwide about this method and I think starting next week and more and more people will start hearing about this, uh, not only from the Weizmann internal news, but also from the, the public and, and uh, general news. And again, also here we have so many volunteers, students and postdocs, also the equipment, um, which is uh, 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 this lab is equipped, equipped with, is being gathered from all over the campus, different labs donated their own PCR machines and robots, and all this has been built and headed by the whole operation is headed by uh, Ziv Reich, the, the, the vice president. So these are the two main efforts which we currently at the Weizmann have done toward tests, toward clinical tests for, uh, for coronavirus. And uh, however, at the same time, in parallel, many groups, many labs, many scientists uh, started other initiatives in order to start developing new tools for preventing the, the infection or treating a, a patient developing either vaccination or small molecule. And I will tell you very, very briefly about um, only four of these, of these efforts. We currently have more than 50 different uh, projects around uh, the coronavirus. Uh, it's divided to many different uh, field and subfield, but when you deal with treatment and prevention, you have two main approach. And one is developing vaccination. And I will tell you about this in a minute. And the, and the second uh, uh, channel is to develop small molecules, which will eventually prevent from the virus either to infect our cells or to proliferate uh, in, our, in, in our cells. Um, some of you attended uh, the talk in the online, the Zoom meeting with uh, Dr. New London or, or Ron Diskin and, and other. Uh, if not, all these uh, presentations are also uh, available online on our website. So I really encourage you to go if you want to learn more, more detail that I will not be able to cover uh, here today. So uh, near London from the Department of uh, Organic uh, Chemistry, is, uh, is part of a very big international project, which is running with Oxford in the US, and uh, sorry, Oxford in the UK, and of course, uh, labs in the US and also Germany. Uh, it's an open source uh, consortium in which there is the free flow of information and reagent between these groups. Near is the one who is adding these efforts and is using uh, a computational model to screen small molecule which can bind a very specific protein at the coronavirus which is very important for the virus to invade into our cells and since and since uh, near is a structural biologist he can use this program to really predict where those molecule can bind and he already screened more than 1000 molecules and he identified 60 molecules which can be a potential target or treatment for for the corona now they, they narrow the list into 30 and they're really working in, in making the best molecule that will be able to, to be used as a drug. This molecule has been sent to the colleagues worldwide, which are checking the, the efficiency of this molecule in, in, in treating uh, uh, the disease. Another important effort is done by Professor Sarel Fleischmann from the Department of Biomolecular Sciences. And Sarel is also using computational models. Sarel is expert in proteins. And as you know, antibodies are a protein. And um, 
by using computational models, uh, Sarel is also using his knowledge, which is also an open source algorithm that can predict, again, the binding of antibodies into very specific proteins, a different protein, the one from that from uh, uh, Nir is doing. And, uh, but again, is developing this, what we call small nano uh, um, antibodies in order to uh, create or generate the best approach to develop new antibodies against this uh, disease. And also Sarel is progressing very well. And we have all the diverse and strong core unit at the Weizmann assisting Sarel in pushing this uh, project uh, forward. You may know that before the corona pandemic happened, we actually had only one lab at the Weizmann, which was really working on, on lethal viruses. And this is the, the, the lab of Fron Diskin, uh, sorry, is in the Department of, of uh, Structural Biology and Alzheimer's Molecular Sciences. And, and Ron worked before on HIV and Ebola, so he was well familiar with the viruses. And for him, the shift toward uh, working with the corona was relatively easy. And Ron is using two parallel approaches. In one hand, he's using, again, very similar to what uh, Nir is doing, screening for small molecule that will be able to target the, uh, the virus, targeting a, a, different, uh, a different type of uh, uh, protein on the virus. But in his uh, other project, he's isolating uh, with his colleagues antibodies which are isolated from patients that uh, uh, are uh, now uh, were infected, show symptoms, but now they're healthy and are carrying anti uh, antibodies in their circulation. So they're isolating these antibodies. They are learning the structure of this antibody. And then they can try and mimic and fit using different computational model molecule that can bind in specific site, different pocket site of this, uh, um, of this uh, uh, virus or uh, antibody. Uh, in a very different type of approach, uh, we have the, the project of Professor Eran Segal from the Department of Computer Science and Applied Mathematics and Professor Benny Geiger, the head of the Department of Immunology. And what Eran is doing, and this also done in, in collaboration with uh, the Hebrew University, Professor Yuval Dor from the Hebrew, from the Dassa and the Hebrew University. In general, it's something that is, is very uh, common during this crisis. There's so many collaborations and, and people don't care about credit, people don't care about patent. Everything is open source and people are sharing and working really uh, day and night in order to make a progress. What Iran uh, and, and Benny did is they developed this relatively simple questionnaire that is sent throughout uh, using different uh, platforms, either uh, WhatsApp or Facebook or uh, general newspapers and TV. And people fill this qu daily questionnaire about their symptoms, how they feel, whether they have fever, or don't have fever. And by using computational model, using artificial intelligence model, Iran and Benny can really predict the spread and the, the outbreak of, of um, this pandemic within Israel, and they made amazing prediction about where it's going to be the next uh, uh, jump in, 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 in people which are infected. This, of course, allowed the authorities to focus their effort into specific uh, cities or even more specific neighborhood within, uh, within the cities. We currently have in, uh, around 400, 500,000 people which are filling this questionnaire on a daily basis. And we have many, many countries around the world which are currently adopting this uh, computational approach and questionnaire approach and helping them fight uh, this virus. So this is only four different type of, of projects in addition to the test I already mentioned, which are currently running the campus. And, but as I mentioned, we have at least 40 more which are targeting different pathways on, on, on the virus proliferation, integration, infection, and other computational approaches about uh, the spread. Many of our scientists are currently uh, busy with what we call the exit strategy. So far, we're very busy by blocking this virus and the infection and make sure that the people are sick and get treatment. 
but currently we need to start thinking about the near future. We hope it's going to be the near future. And this is the, the exit strategy, how we going to start going back to work and getting the, the economy stand up again. And this is involving a lot of predictions, people coming from totally different fields, from computer science to mathematics, to physics, to biology, and even psychology. And, and this you're going to hear more and more in the next few weeks about this uh, exit strategy and how we will behave. Because apparently this is here with us to stay for quite a while. And you cannot maintain this type of uh, uh, keeping people under uh, quarantine for such for, for longer uh, periods of, um, of time. Very additional and important activities, uh, and let me move it directly into the English version, is uh, the amazing activities which are done by our uh, educational arm of the Weizmann Institute, which is the Davidson Institute. And as you know, the Davidson have many activities for kids and in Israel and many other countries, kids from different ages are stay at home. They cannot go to school, uh, which is uh, not easy for them. It's not easy for sometimes the, for the parents. And uh, very quickly after a few days, the Davidson team managed to have open a site called Stuck at Home and incorporate inside many, many activities. On a regular days, as you know, our website is in Hebrew and Arabic, but uh, a week ago, even a little bit more, in a major effort, they managed to translate many of the, of the activities already in English. Uh, unlike you know, uh, thousands of entries every day, we have tens of thousands of entries to our website and activities. And they are now busy with translating those activities also to Spanish, which hopefully it will be online uh, 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 very soon. Okay, so I, I will stop here at, at uh, ten, um, about the effort that the Weizmann is doing. Again, this is only a very small, very small part. Yeah, I definitely use more than 15 minutes. So I will try to make the second half uh, shorter. Um, but this is, as I mentioned already, this, uh, this period is extremely challenging for us. And uh, I would say even uh, very, very stressful. And I think we are very good in assessing uh, our state, our mental state, our state of stress. If we are stressed, we know we feel it. We also are very good in assessing stress in our loved one. Yeah, we can look in our family members, our parents, our kids, our spouses, and we can feel if they're stressed or not stressed. And the big question is why? Why, why, why we need those feelings? Why, why the brain is doing this to us? Um, and I, I, want, I want to explain a little bit what is this uh, process. So let's, let's imagine this uh, scenario. Yeah, we are sitting on, on the sofa reading of course, an article just published from the Weizmann Institute. And then we get this SMS, a message that we have 247 new COVID-19 cases in your, in your area. Most of us will perceive this message as, as stressful. And in a millisecond after reading this message, your brain will activate what is known is the central stress response, the stress response. And most of you, all of you can describe the feelings which are associated with this activation. You're going to have a massive increase in your heart rate, in your blood pressure, in your blood glucose level. It will jump from 100, 160, 180, just by, by activating this uh, uh, response. Your respiration Will, uh, will, will increase. Uh, your cortisol level, your stress hormone level will increase. But not only peripherally, not only in your body, also centrally within your brain, the level of your emotions will change. You will have increase in your fear and anxiety. You're gonna have changes in your cognition, in your memory. Your, your locomotion is gonna, gonna change. Some of you will freeze, some of you will start moving faster around uh, you're going to have changes in your attention, in your attention focus. You're going to have changes in your uh, appetite. 
So almost every major center of your brain will respond to this uh, type of uh, stressful uh, uh, stimuli. However, this is a totally normal and a healthy response. I remind you that this response is highly conserved through evolution all the way from fish to human. And the purpose of this response, it's a survival response, is to allow you to cope with the challenge. But unlike a situation in which someone just, you know, you were riding your bicycle and someone just cut you with a car on a sidewalk and, uh, and this response will be activated in your heart rate and blood pressure, everything gonna increase. In a minute, this stressful is not relevant anymore. The system, the brain will switch off this response and will restore homeostasis, meaning it will reduce they uh, will switch off this activation. You bring all your systems back to the original steady state. And this is a normal and healthy response. However, during this pandemic, this the fact we are continuously exposed to more and more stress, this uncertainty or the news we are hearing and, and, and the fact we are locked in this situation for weeks and hopefully not months, putting us in this chronic level, chronic stress mode of activation. So our system is upregulated, not always in the, of course, in the highest level of activation. However, this chronic exposure is of course putting us in, uh, in a risk and some of us do, do uh, feel it in different uh, ways. And how this is, uh, manifested and what we of course know very well from, from the literature is the fact that when we expose to this type of chronic stress or other type of chronic stress and when we don't properly regulate this control, when you don't really minimize this exposure and really allow our body to properly shut down and response, this is strongly associated with a large variety of disorders all the way from you know, depression and anxiety and um, and eating disorders or not only not only psychiatry related but also metabolic related and, and heart related and immune related uh, therefore as much as we can reduce the exposure or try to minimize uh, the level of stress associated with uh, this current crisis, we're all going to benefit. So, but how, how can we do it? Or maybe just mention before I su suggest a few things, and I'm sure all of you can suggest similar or even more or other things. I would just mention that in addition to the fact that all of us are very worried about, about being a uh, infected or our loved one will be infected or by uh, the uncertainty associated with this, meaning work related and, and other issues. We have also other stressors which are due to the situation. Of course, many of us are in isolation, which is not easy. You know, isolation is one of the most common uh, causes for, for depression. The fact that we are now stuck with family member 24 seven, some people like it, some people like it less, and is definitely creating some conflict. I don't know why the lady here is the one which is upsetting, I upset, but I'm sure that it's equally distributed in the population. The fact that we are hearing news almost on a, at least in Israel, on a half an hour basis is another source of uh, stressors and, and so on. And most of the things I would usually um, offer people to, oh, I would just mention this before because it's important. Despite everything I just said, it's really important to remember that uh, both the way we perceive those stress, this pandemic, and the way we also respond to it is extremely individual. Some people really enjoy the situation, but I will say they are the minority. Uh, some people are not getting very anxious about this and say, oh, it's fine, don't worry, I will have more time to work in my garden or do other things. But other people are extremely anx anxious about the situation and it's definitely affecting. And if I, I see from my colleagues around the world, 
I, I and in Israel, of course, uh, psychiatrists, I, I can see this increased number in demand for uh, for uh, for treatment. So the usual, oh, another uh, important uh, probably difference is the difference between uh, men and women. Um, and as I'm sure you know, both the behavioral and the hormonal effect uh, of stress is different between the sexes. And um, it's, I'm not gonna go into the mechanism and why, what are the reason is just to emphasize the fact that female and women are two to three times uh, or the prevalence of stress-related mood disorders, such as depression, anxiety, is two to three times higher in women than in uh, men. This is something we also need to take into, into consideration. So even uh, regular days when you stress, I will tell you, oh, just go ahead and have more social contact, social event, enjoy, not necessarily drink alcohol, maybe one glass of wine is good. But uh, in these days that we are forced for social distancing, of course, we cannot do that. We cannot go to crowded places. We cannot go to the movie. We cannot go to the concert, the opera. And the same things, uh, we need to avoid hugs and kisses, which is something that's also very comforting. Uh, traveling the world in Israel, it's very common. In our neighborhood, people like to relax or so they go far away and try to and just enjoy traveling. And this is something that is also we cannot do today. So we need to find uh, other ways and other solution to, uh, to stay calm and reduce the stress level. So one way to do it is what we are doing now. Uh, use Zoom, use other platform in order to communicate. Uh, in a few days, we're going to celebrate uh, Passover, Pesach here, and I think one of the most common uh, instruction uh, program running now in WhatsApp is how to teach your grandma and grandpa to use Zoom. Uh, and uh, this is a great way to continue uh, staying communicating with your loved one and friends. This is the way the education system in Israel, uh, in high school and in university are continuing to run. And we should use it and use it as much as uh, as much as we uh, we can. Another way which doesn't require a lot of space and you can always do it alone. Even better, doing it alone is any type of meditation or mindfulness. You know, as a scientist, I'm always try to use methods which are scientifically valid, and there is a lot of literature about mindfulness. And uh, definitely something that is relaxing. Those of you who are not familiar and didn't get training, there are different ways, different apps to try and do it. There's a lot of online uh, program to try and do it. I have to admit that personally, I started doing it recently, regardless of the corona. And I think it's uh, fantastic. Maybe not to everyone, but those of you who find it uh, useful, I think you should uh, use it this or any other type of uh, uh, meditation. Uh, many of us are using uh, psychologists, many of us doing psychotherapy, talking to someone. I know that most of psychologists, psychiatrists are continuing to work online I know it's different and a different feeling. It's a very different feeling for me now to talk to all of you, around 500 people, and 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 I don't see you. I don't, you know, I don't watch your faces, your responses. And then I see only myself in the screen and the slide, which is a very different. But I think you get used to it. I think I did it already four or five times, and you get used to it. And I think those of you who need it should continue doing this type of, of, of meetings and, and discussions and treatment as much as much as you can. But of course, it's a very personal. One of the things that is probably the most scientific is exercise. Unfortunately, we cannot go now and start running. In Israel, it's limited, I think, now to 50 or 100 meter. And I saw that someone is running around, around, uh, uh, around his house. Uh, but it doesn't have to be running, you know, it could be any type of activity, even muscle activity, everyone, he or she, according to his limit, you don't need to be an Ironman in order to benefit from this. 
scientifically we know this is generating increasing the number of newborn cells in your brain in areas which are extremely relevant to your mood, to your cognition. It's mimicking the effect of antidepressants. So as much as you can do activity, even within the, within your house, within your apartment, I think this is uh, this is uh, uh, a blessing. Uh, and of course, any other type of activity, those of you who can walk, can run, even if it's in a short distance, this is something uh, you should you should uh, do here at the Weizmann. Of course, we're lucky to have our gated campus so we can enjoy uh, our beautiful campus and our green uh, uh, campus. And of course, all of you are good friends of the Weizmann, just, just stay in touch, go to our website, go to our uh, uh, YouTube and Facebook and Instagram and follow the activities that are uh, done here on campus is so active and it's all changing on a daily basis that uh, uh, I really recommend going every day into the website and see what what is uh, new. So I will stop here and thank you very much again for for the attention. And um, and I, let's start with uh, with the question. I'll take my phone and see if I already got something. Wow. Okay, I have many. Okay, I will start. There's a long link. Link, uh, list of questions. Um, what are the best possibilities and time frames for the development of treatment of vaccine? It's a fantastic question. I know it's really, really hard to predict. I remind you that we have viruses such as HIV or Ebola that, I don't know, 30 or 40 years, we don't have vaccine yet. So although we hear almost on a daily basis, different countries, different companies, different institutions, just about to develop a vaccination, it's really, really hard to predict. So there is the stage of development, which can take months if it's working, many months. But then don't forget, we need to scale it up. We need to make it accessible for the public. So I don't see, we don't see vaccination or development of vaccine as something that will come on, on, on the time frame of, of weeks. Either it will be many months or years, on, on none. Um, this virus is, is changing. It's hard to, to see how is you know, the mutation and how fast it will, it will change, mainly because we don't have a treatment yet. In a minute, we're going to have a treatment. We're going to force the virus to, to start. We're going to do a selection in a way. It will start uh, changing as, as soon as we're going to start treating it. So it's a lot of unknown uh, about the vaccination. What is will be very effective, and it's of course related, is isolating the antibodies, the immunoglobulins, what you call the IgG from people who are infected, but they are now healthy. And this is a lot of effort worldwide to isolate those IgG from the blood of patients. This could be used as a treatment. Of course, it's a short-term treatment, but people which are in, in, uh, in, in emergency care and other people could definitely benefit. So as, as long as we have more people which actually cope with this, were infected and are healthy and will donate blood, this will help isolating those uh, uh, IgD, those immunoglobulins. How does uh, Professor Elinav and Amit's faster testing compared to Abbott lab 15 minute test used by President Trump yesterday in a ruling? Okay, I saw this also in the news two days ago, what the Abbott, uh, I think it's a similar concept, which is a sequencing based. Uh, of course, I'm not familiar exactly because it's not uh, public about the technology of Abbott and how, and how they do it. Uh, I saw also the article, uh, knowing very well what Ido and Iran are doing, this is based on a similar concept. Uh, but of course we, give it uh, free of charge. We're gonna share the knowledge uh, with everyone. I think most of uh, institution worldwide, uh, unfortunately in Israel, the, the academic research, research institution like the Weizmann and other universities have better equipment than the Ministry of Health or the clinical labs of, so adopting this, making similar labs like we developed here, would definitely can increase the numbers of, of tests. There's a lot of other hurdles on the way, which I'm not getting into, which is really changing the way we are currently collecting samples. Okay, the classical tests, I don't know how Abbott are doing this, but 
the collection of the samples currently in Israel are doing with, uh, with those long swabs and, and, and uh, in a single tube. And our protocol now is using very small swab going into your nose and going into a small well in a plate. But to the best of my understanding, the technology uh, is, is very similar, but we will see in the next uh, few days. Okay, I will, I will read it again, then I will try to understand the question. I'm sleeping 50 to 60% of time, still studying mechanical engineering, but I cannot feel an atmosphere of normality, especially related to my recent tiredness all the time. How should I manage myself and fix it? Also fat less appetite as well. This is definitely, you know, symptoms of, could be a symptoms of stress, but could be also symptoms of uh, less activity. Um, I'm avoiding giving clinical uh, recommendation because I'm not a clinician, uh, but for my common sense, and I'm sure you're gonna hear uh, similar things from your doctor is just try to increase activity, try to be more active uh, on a daily basis, doing more breaks, Maybe don't go to sleep so much, even if you feel tired, uh, but definitely consulting with uh, a physician would be a good idea. But I think, I think it's normal. I think many people today uh, feel the same because definitely in one way, changing our routine, uh, the amount of activity we are doing in our uh, daily schedule on one hand, on the other, we are much more stressful about the situation, mainly from the uncertainty. When we're gonna go back to school? When we're gonna go back to work? When we're gonna see next my my mother, which is 81 and I cannot see her for weeks now. So this is a normal response and uh, most of us can cope ourselves by doing different things as much as each of us can, can do either working on the garden, if you have a garden or or reading a book or doing uh, something else. And many of us, some of us cannot cope well. And those who cannot cope well should ask for some help and don't keep it. And there's a lot of help around. So, and it's, it's amazing to see how many people would like, how many people are engaged and would like to help and assist other, others. I, I, I didn't see such a collegiality for many, many years within the scientific community, but also Within the country, people are extremely polite. And, you know, in Israel, it's not, uh, it's very evident. Um, and um, I, I think there are ways to, uh, to cope. Can we, can we go in even deeper lockdown? Is there a chance the Institute will be uh, closed for everything other than Corona research? Uh, it's a fantastic question. Things are changing almost on a daily basis. Uh, we, in the first two weeks of this crisis, we, all the presidents of the Institute, we fought very hard with the government not to lock the places. Um, all the scientists are allowed to come, but we have to minimize the, the number of people on campus. So, uh, so we are limited every lab to four people in each lab. Uh, so each lab is monitoring who is coming and how, just in order to keep the social distancing. However, we have we are have a total number of, for the whole institute, and since we have to keep essential systems like the animal facilities and you know and pumps and water and electricity and and, and gases and other things, we have to first focus on those. Otherwise, you're going to have a very long term consequences of what will happen in the next few months. There are experiments which are here running for years, and we really need to to maintain them. We currently do not predict that things will be a percentage wide at least worse than this regarding the lockdown, at least not within a research institute. We do have a plan for that just to keep really the, the basic and the minimum. Uh, we have all our Corona people examined for this. So we have around 250 people currently on campus just around Corona. And these are got permits from the government, of course, to, to continue and working. It will be very hard to go lower with the number and still keep this place uh, running. 
the way with the number of infection currently in Israel and the situation, we are very optimistic. We don't think we're going to have even stronger lockdown than, than we currently have. Intermittent lockdown are mentioned as a trade-off between spread and the economy. The U.S. seems to be moving to a trial and error approach of existing, informed by the health and system capacity. Germany seems to be using a massive test to lift the, uh, the lockdown. This is a fantastic question. So um, there is, as, as I mentioned before, there is now the main focus of most of the committees, and I'm involved in many of those committees now in Israel, is focusing on the on the exit strategy. And definitely the exit strategy will, will be based on much larger number of tests. In order to allow people to go back, you wanna, you wanna release people back to, to work if you know they are not infectious anymore, whether they were sick already, and we know currently we don't have, we don't have any evidence for multiple infections. So if someone were infected and is now healthy, he will not be infected again. It was at least one study in non-human primate which confirmed this. We don't have any known cases that I know in human of, of secondary infect, uh, additional infection. So the idea will be to start bringing the economy back into normal by releasing either very spe specific group of people or very specific places, meaning we will need to really monitor. So if you have a neighborhood which is have 30% infection, the chances you will go out of this neighborhood is extremely low. In, uh, vice versa, if you have a neighborhood which is clearly you have not infected any infected people of very small percentage, they will allow people to go out. And this is the strategy that Israel is, is currently planning, or this is what the committees, the academic committees are recommending to the government uh, uh, to do. I think the US, at least what I'm following in the news is I think around three weeks back from what we are currently doing in Israel, if you look on the mortality rate, uh, you can see that Israel is actually in the best situation. It's with Israel and then Germany and then the rest of Europe. And of course, uh, US, uh, we can learn a lot with, with what has been done in China and South Korea and Singapore. And it was based, at least in South Korea, it was heavily based on a lot of tests and of course a lockdown. So this, this formula is definitely working. Um, following the above statement that I just mentioned, sorry, how would you go about lifting lockdown in a way that is manageable until we reach uh, herd immunity or vaccine? So this is exactly what I described. You need to do, at least in Israel, we are 8 million. We need to do uh, tens of thousands of tests every day. We need to aim to do 100,000, 200,000 every day, which I think is feasible with the new technologies, and then slowly come up with models, with mathematical models throughout the country and say, this is a clean area. They can go to work. And when they go to work, we need to make sure they are interacting only with healthy people and, and so on. I think those type of models will start being released soon into, into the public. There's many smart and good people working on developing those exit strategy models. I hope I'm going on the right because it's, it's jumping the whole time. So how long the virus active on surfaces when it is safe to touch the surface? Okay, so these few studies came out. This study already for more than three weeks ago, talking about hours to days depending on the surface, okay? Whether it's a, it's a metal surface and with the metal, which type of a surface and then uh, cardboard or other. So it's between hours to days, to many days. I even studied talking about almost two weeks, 13 days on surfaces. And this is the reason the best protection currently are actually gloves. Gloves and keeping washing or using uh, alcohol gel and things that we have here. You see what I'm, going with this big bucket of, of, uh, of uh, alcohol wipe that everywhere I go, when I go to the elevator, I'm using this, when I go to the bathroom, when I open door, I use this type, so any other type. So this is the best. We still need to wear masks, but I think the majority of the infections, unless someone is really sneezing on you or coughing on you, the, 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 probably the majority of infections will come from touching surfaces and then touching your face, mouth, nose. And, and so on. 
Okay, why do women uh, have more stress than men? Can you explain the science behind it? Okay, this is beyond the corona, of course, and um, it's not having more stress, it's the way they respond uh, to stress. Of course, I'm talking here by average. If I'm measuring cortisol, the level of cortisol would be higher. And there is, a, again, of course, in behaviorally, and there is uh, differences. And um, th there are two, I will not go to the, to the, I would say evolutionary reasons, okay? Which we can all think about it through evolution. Of course, the, 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 the role of women was to protect the offsprings. So of course, if they are more alert, uh, and uh, are more, you know, searching the environment. They're more alert. They they be more jumpy, and they can protect more their, their pups. So this is the the evolutionary uh, concept. However, we know that uh, bioclimically and molecularly, cellularly, uh, testosterone is an inhibitor of the HPA axis of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, the release of of cortisol. So it's not that in female this cortisol axis is more active is the fact that this axis in men is inhibited. So this is one of the explanation. Also through development, uh, meaning estrogen, or this, not only circulating estrogen, but also estrogen through development is wiring the brain in a way that the response, the behavioral response in female is different. Again, don't look on individual cases. We have a lot of female who respond much better than male. If you look on the average and they're all uh, population. I hope it's it was clear. How is the people from rural uh, Israel coping with the crisis? Can they buy groceries online or that is adding stress to their daily life? Honestly, I don't think so. I, th I think this is one of the first cases that people living in dense cities have more stress than people who live in rural area. Uh, of course, food, we don't have any shortage, shortage in, in food and groceries. People can still go and purchase everything they need. Supermarkets are open. Of course, they're uh, controlling the, the access and the entrance and people have to wear masks and people are keeping this two meter uh, distance and only a specific number of people can go inside. I went today at 6 a.m. to avoid the lines and I went out at 7 a.m out of the supermarket and it was a line which was at least one hour line because uh, everything is much slower. Uh, you can still, uh, uh, of course, order online to make take longer than usual, but I don't think we have any, any issues with getting food or groceries. Uh, there is a lot of organization that now are delivering food to uh, to elderly people who cannot go outside. And uh, it's really in Israel in its beauty. It's, it's really amazing how we, we, we operate and th these days. I have to admit as a country which is used to a different type of crisis and the fact we do have the army is extremely helpful. Uh, we started yesterday a huge project by sampling all the policemen in Israel and just for coronavirus tests in the INCPM. And the people who connected, collected the samples are our soldiers. We have 25 group of soldiers came two days ago in the morning, got instructed by our scientists, drove all over the country, and in the evening came back here with the 1500 samples and the plan they're gonna do it again on, on, on Sunday morning. Do you believe in would subscribe the strategy of massive testing, certifying individual and returning those that are supposedly immune back to work. Yeah, of course, it's, it's, there's a lot of side question to this. And the question, if someone that has already been infected can go back currently to the best of our knowledge, yes, we just need to be confirmed. I don't know what is the gold standard worldwide. In Israel, someone who was infected is tested twice. After the two weeks of isolation, he's tested once. If he's positive, we had another five days and tested again. If he's negative at the second day, is he can go back currently home like any other citizen but cannot back to work i do support to the with the knowledge we currently have uh and this is my personal impression and my calling impression that massive testing will will be beneficial for this of course ideally we should have not only a pcr type of approach but serology whether we can really look for antibodies 
but to date is not sufficiently good test uh, to do the uh, the serology or the antibody uh, test with high efficiency. Is the Ministry of Health acting in a swift manner to properly coordinate testing and treatment occurring in institute extra across um, Israel? Is there room for improvement? Yes, there is always room for improvement. It's not easy. There's huge pressure on the system, especially in the Ministry of Health. We have a daily, I think I have today five or six or seven talks, phone calls with the Minister of Health, with the head, uh, try to improve processes. It's not easy. Many of the things have tough regulations and me as the president of the Weizmann also always need to think about the Weizmann and our strength and health and our uh, exposure to lawsuit in the future. So there's a lot of discussions that I'm currently not sharing, but it's always in the background of those, uh, of those efforts. But if the question whether we can do more, yes, definitely, we can do more from the government side. I think we are maximizing our effort here within the Institute. It's not easy to change you know, routines. If we now we need to change the way we collect samples in the in the population, it will require some logistics and they will need to adapt accordingly. Um, but I think the next week or two are going to be really critical. Although we're going into Passover week, um, things will continue to run and have to have to adapt. Wow, this is a tough question. For how long uh, will we uh, be confined? What is your guess? Uh, if you are talking about Israel, um, in the I think it's very different from different countries just by looking on the number. Israel currently, at least the slope, the curve is starting to be flattened. It's going down. Um, I think it really depends on the economy. I think what the government would like to do is as soon as possible to start getting people back to work, especially the essential people. If you ask, for example, the education system, I don't think that high school or universities are in high priority to go back because they can start continue studying online, the majority of them. However, it's important to have kindergarten and going back or law school just because then their parents can go to work. So it's going to be gradual, but it will happen. Uh, not a profit, but uh, I think it will probably be a few weeks uh, before we can start releasing the hold. But th the worst case is then we release it, people feel safe, and then we have a second wave, and second wave can come. So we have to be extremely careful. We need to learn to live with this for a few months, definitely. Uh, some of the models are talking till September, October. Uh, but then, of course, we cannot keep this level of lockdown till September, October, because the system will collapse. So I think they will start releasing it, but in a very controlled, very controlled manner. Some say it is not good to promote the view that stress cause, causes disease. Okay, so some people can say we cannot argue with science. It's, of course, not a black and white. Uh, some... And when I talk about stress, stress can affect you in the different st stages of your life. It's not only the environment, it's not only the stress which is outside, it's also, of course, your genetic makeup. And many of us do carry what we call genetic predisposition to develop those diseases. Meaning if I do not have genetic predisposition, I can work, uh, live a very, very stressful life, but still don't develop a disease. However, many of us do carry genetic predisposition to develop many diseases, could be depression or, or anxiety or also cancer or Alzheimer. What eventually will determine whether you will develop or not develop a disease is the environment. And within the environment, stress is the most significant uh, factor. So I have to disagree, but it doesn't mean that everyone be exposed to stress will develop a disease, of course. Yeah, some of us will. Are there uh, budget limitation to the work at Weizmann? How can we help? Well, of course, meaning that it's always uh, a limitation um, in budget. This is, of course, we didn't expect this corona pandemic. We didn't budget at any uh, of what we do now. I have to be honest and say that even what we do for the government, we're currently doing on our budget just to save time and 
And I have to say, thank God that we ordered what we ordered three weeks ago to run those tests because currently worldwide is shortage in, in reagent in order to do tests. This is the main issue currently worldwide. We have enough labs, but we don't have enough reagent. And we do have uh, a nice stock of reagent to, to run many of the experiments we are currently, many of the tests we are currently doing. But support is of course needed. It's, it's heavily needed. We, we started this fund. Uh, I think we already um, had around $4 million uh, within this fund, ranging from very small a donation to a, a bigger one, but every help is, is of course welcome and important and, uh, and extremely appreciated. I think there's more questions, but uh, I think I will just from, because of the time, I, I will need to stop here. And I would like to wish you all happy Passover, um, Pesach Sameach, and please stay safe and healthy and uh, you know, in Hebrew, we saw we say, you know, avarno et paro avor meaning we went through Pharaoh. We're also gonna survive this. So please be patient and and, and you know, listen to the regulation. Keep yourself uh, safe and healthy. And thank you very much for your time. And please stay in touch. We care very much about you, as you care about the white man. So Shabbat Shalom, have a nice weekend, and thank you very much. Bye-bye.